Oh, I forgot how yeah. Do you over again? Good morning, I'm Council Member Peter Ku, and I'm the Chair of the Committee on Technology. I want to welcome you all to our hearing. The hearing will focus on Intro 986, a local law in relation to the format of data in agency reports. Intro 1094, sponsored by the Speaker, a local law in relation to oversight assets to agency data and intro 1098, sponsored by Council Member Kalos, a local law in relation to digitization of historic data. The open data law and the resulting open data portal have, by almost any measure, been a success. An open data census acknowledged New York City as a leading municipality in providing data transparency to the public through the open data portal. This success is credited both to the underlying law itself as well as to the implementation and hard work that has been demonstrated by the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications and the Mayor's Office of Data Analysis and Data Analytics. The hearing will, co will focus on how government data can be easily accessible, non propriety and machine readable for, fu uh, for further use, studies, and analysis. We expect to see continued efforts in providing accessible data and data transparency. I look forward to hearing from the panels today, and I would like to thank the Technology Committee staff by putting together this hearing. I also like to recognize the technology committee members, uh, which will they come later. Thank you. So, uh, so we're gonna have a first panel from the mayor's office of operation, uh, leading by Emily Newman, and New York City Department of Records and, trans uh, and Information. Pauline Tu. And also we have uh, Department of Technology and Telecommunication. So will the council uh, swear the uh, members in here? I need to ask you, raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the only truth, and nothing but the truth before our committee and your testimony today? Yes. yes. Thank you. We can start. Great, thank you. Um, good morning, Chairman Ku and members of the Committee on Technology. My name is Emily Newman. I'm the Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Operations. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on Intro 1094, a local law in relation to oversight access to agency data, and Intro 986, a local law in relation to the format of data in agency reports. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Laura Negron, the City's Chief Privacy Officer, James Perrazzo, the city's acting director of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, and Don Sunderland, deputy commissioner for data management and integration at the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, all of whom will be available to answer questions. The Mayor's Office of Operations works to make New York City government more effective and efficient. Operations includes the Mayor's Office of Information Privacy and the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. The office has a key role in leading the city's work on open data and privacy protection, each relevant for today's hearing. The administration shares the council's belief in effective data sharing among city entities and supports data-focused research. To this end, the administration has implemented various initiatives to help facilitate data access and exchange across city entities, while striking a balance with important legal privacy considerations as well. Being nine months pregnant means you run out of breath quickly, so I apologize. <laughs> it's a lot of words. A key example of the administration's commitment to data sharing is the Citywide Data Integration Initiative, created in 2015 as part of the administration's 10-year strategic plan, One NYC, to help strengthen the city's capacity for data integration. Developed and managed by operations, this initiative provides a privacy-compliant privacy one-city approach to data 
using a centralized technology platform to ensure a more effective and efficient use of city resources. This framework requires an approved scope of work and executed legal project agreement for every multi-agency data sharing project involving identifying information in which, in which each and every data element or category requested must be authorized by relevant agency privacy officers. While this is a time intensive process, this approach helps to advance important cross agency work while at the same time ensuring that the city complies with applicable state, federal, and local laws that protect New Yorkers' personally identifying information. While this initiative is complex, it helps make key city programs possible, including Homestead and Pre-K for All. We'd be happy to provide further information about this initiative and discuss how the council may participate to help advance its data and research goals. This administration is also committed to open data, a policy that makes city data available to the public wherever possible. Since 2012, the open data portal has grown to include more than 2,000 data sets, and that number is growing. New York City Open Data is a world-class program with a citywide scope. It's a highly visible cross-agency program dedicated to transparency and open government, while also encouraging research and analytical best practices. Open data has been used by New York City residents and city agencies to conduct research and inform important policy decisions. For example, open data includes the city's tree census and information that helps emergency responders formulate the best routes to get to where they need to go. There are many other examples, some of which can be viewed in this year's Open Data for All report. This administration is deeply committed to protecting the privacy of New Yorkers' personal information and advancing privacy best practices. In furtherance of this commitment, the Mayor's Office of Information Privacy was established by executive order in 2018. Protecting the privacy of sensitive personal information is critical to ensure compliance with applicable laws and regulations and promote residents' trust in their government. This is particularly relevant for vulnerable people who may be harmed, in their in, who may be harmed if their information is improperly shared. We know the Council is similarly committed to protecting New Yorkers' identifying information, as evident in Local Laws 245 and 247 of 2017, known together as the Identifying Information Law. These laws, which establish the Chief Privacy Officer role, restrict the collection and disclosure of identifying information across more than 175 city agencies and offices. While we share the Council's values around data and privacy, we would like to provide comments on two of the bills on the docket today. As written, we believe Intro 1094 is not a feasible strategy for efficiently accessing city data for three primary reasons. First, it empowers the Chief Privacy Officer with the sole authority to approve council employees' access to any information held in the city's central data platform. Authorizing access to city data for research and analytic purposes requires a fact-specific legal review and determination made in collaboration with agency privacy officers. This review is based on the laws and legal privileges protecting the confidentiality of the information. From our experience implementing the citywide data integration initiative, we believe this approach proposed would not expedite access to data. From a feasibility standpoint, it is not possible for the chief privacy officer to assess every data request made under this bill within the proposed timeline, nor would it be for any city official or agency to review within days every relevant record for the potential application of each confidentiality protection or legal privilege before providing access to city council members and staff. Secondly, personally identifiable information is heavily governed by many federal and state laws that the city cannot overcome by local law, even if a privacy training course were completed. And lastly, <coughs> based on our conversations with our partners at DoIt, we understand that a clean room is not an industry standard and would not mitigate the risk of data being misused or removed from city computers. We welcome the opportunity to discuss alternative strategies with the council for efficiently accessing city data where permitted by law. We also wanna take this opportunity to highlight the value of open data and the richness of what the open data law requires and provides. As mentioned earlier, many agencies and offices currently use open data to do extensive internal research and the tool is useful to both the public and city employees wishing to conduct effective, important research. 
under the open data law, any regularly maintained data that appears in a report or can otherwise be made public is either already public or in the process of being made public, oh sorry, of being made available on the open data portal. In contrast, data bridge is a piece of, tech of technical architecture and not ultimately a data source itself. We would therefore encourage a continued conversation about the best way to maximize and fully leverage the information already available through open data for the council's analytic and research purposes. With regard to intro 986, operation similarly understands and agrees that what seems to be the spirit of this bill, with what seems to be the spirit of this bill, data on open data should not only be available, but also reasonably accessible, meaning that it could be used for analytic for analysis readily. Most data that is currently in publicly available reports is available on the open data portal with few exceptions where it is either not feasible, legal, or meaningful. We look forward to discussing this bill further as well and hope to work with the council to find a solution. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. As you know, this administration is dedicated to using research and data to make informed policy decisions that improve the lives of all New Yorkers. We look forward to collaborating with you to find workable strategies and solutions for accomplishing our shared goals. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, Chair Koo and members of the Committee on Technology um, and staff, uh, I am Pauline Tool, the Commissioner of the Department of Records and Information Services, commonly called DORIS. DORIS is responsible for preserving and providing access to the historical and contemporary records of New York City government, ensuring that city records are properly maintained following professional archival and record manager management practices, and making city government's records available to diverse communities through the municipal archives and the municipal library. The department shares the city council's goals to increase accessibility and usability of the city's historic records. In fact, the municipal archivist has been overseeing the development of an open source integrated solution to preserve and provide access to both archival and library records. It will be fully operational in 2020. We are currently storing over 185 terabytes of digital archival information, both born digital and newly digitized. We expect that number to grow exponentially as we continue to acquire born digital records and as we digitize historical records in various formats. This solution will ensure the preservation of historical records over the long term and provide access up to that material to the public. Digitization efforts in the past year have included 9 million historical vital records, executive orders, liquor licenses, borough president photographs, Department of Finance 1940s tax photographs, almshouse records, bodies in transit records, and more. Our online gallery hosts over 1.1 million photographs and records that are freely available to the public from anywhere. Our end goal is to make the library and archival records available online worldwide. Intro 1098 by Councilmember Kalos would require archivists to conduct a search through 246,000 cubic feet and 185 terabytes of historical records. Correspondence, maps, drawings, building plans, photos, genealogical records, film, etc., to locate information in a non narrative form, assess the value of putting that information into another format and include that newly created document on the open data portal. The volume of hard records alone is enormous, the equivalent of three Olympic sized swimming pools filled with boxes of paper. It would require decades of dedicated staff time to implement this proposal and the exercise would yield very little of public value. The value to the public of the archival collections is that they document city government's activities in primary source records. This history can't be tabulated. It's rich and nuanced and requires people to read and draw conclusions mm -hmm. and offer the insights they learn from perusing the collections. Requiring the archivist to extract statistical information and create new records removes the information from its original context. This would upend decades of practice. Archivists appraise, preserve, and make available entire collections in an unedited format for research purposes. 
Creating subsets of data drawn from the archival records is the role of researchers, not archivists. And I want to just reference a document I could share with you later. It's a copy of um, uh, the Flushing lists, and it is the list of possessions uh, taken from a woman's estate when she died. You don't know any, if you just put that information online, you wouldn't know where, where was she from, what was her relationship to her neighbors, or anything else that's relevant for historians who do this kind of research. Uh, so, I and the department look forward to working with the city council to further develop solutions to our shared policy goals of increase, increasing the accessibility of city government's historical records and making them available to diverse populations. I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and if you had questions, I would try to answer them. Thank you. Uh, we are joined by Council Member Holden. Uh, I have a few questions uh, on, uh, first on intro 986, uh, is there any citywide standard on how agencies should provide data in a report? Do we have any standard now? Anyone can do it, can answer the question? No? I don't believe that we have um, a citywide standard. Uh, each agency maintains their own data um, and and uses it in the report mm. as is appropriate for the report requirements. So what, what data is on the mayor's dashboard? And do you know that? On the mayor's dashboard? Yeah. Um, which dashboard are you referring to? The, the one uh, he uses on his phone? Oh. Uh, the data that we make available comes from the citywide performance reporting tool, mm. um, which is available publicly um, as well. Mm. So if someone send you, uh, or send, would send you a report with the data in PDF, uh, would you be able to use this uh, data? I mean, if I send you a report in PDF, can you can, can do it? With the data, I'm sure some of you can, but some of you cannot, right? I mean, it, it, it depends on the form, form that the data actually takes in the PDF itself. Yeah. I mean, at this time, there are certainly technologies that can attempt to read text. Actually making sense of the text and parsing it into data-readable format would be a significant piece of work for everyone that you wanted to do this mm -hmm. with. It wouldn't be something that could be done generically. As far as the underlying data that might appear in charts or tables, um, there wouldn't be references within the report necessarily that would allow you to map that back to the original data mm. that produced it. Yeah, that's why the, the main goal of uh, this uh, introduction 986 is uh, to make sure agencies use uh, machine readable formats when uh, sending reports or, uh, to other agencies. So I just want to add that um, much of the underlying data uh, where it's relevant for the open data law is available publicly. Um, again, it's going to depend on the report and whether there's any personally identifiable mm. information there. But much of the data is already available or is part of the 400 plus data sets that we're working over the next year to add online to open data. So, so do you know how many reports still provide data only in the PDF format? I do not. No? Uh, would, would it be a difficulty, a technical difficulty, to provide data in a machine-readable file? Uh, again, no. I think it depends on what the data is that's being asked for um, and whether there's any personally identifiable, identifiable information included. Okay. Yeah. So uh, now I go to questions on... Uh, 1094. So what what data does the mayor's office of operations use to track agency performance besides the CPR? I'm very happy to say we have the annual mayor's management report coming out today. <laughs> um, so your timing is great. Yeah. Um, we have a whole book with 45 agencies included um, where we track um, 
quite a bit of um, uh, data um, on each agency. You can see historic trends. Um, and so we, we track much of that data monthly, some of it's annual, um, but we have a um, rich amount of data that we make public that we track for each agency. Okay. So has the administration ever shared any long public data with a member of the public using the long disclosure agreement? No, yes. Huh? Could, could you repeat the question, please? So has the administration ever shared any long public data with a member of the public using a long disclosure agreement? Are you speaking about the citywide data integration agreement? Yeah, yeah, long, di no. Uh, I, I guess I don't, I don't fully know the answer. Yeah. We share data um, across agencies. We share data with our um, contractors and vendors using non-disclosure agreements. Mm -hmm. We try to be very careful, and I'm sure our chief privacy officer can add details, but we try to be very careful with the sharing of data, um, but we certainly don't just sort of casually share data with the public um, where it doesn't make sense. Sure. Um, although we, um, as I've said, make a lot of data available um, through the open data law and the open data portal. So I mean specifically to like res researchers or vendors, you know, they need this data set uh -huh. uh, from the agency. Uh, so have you ever done it? Uh, if you're speaking about non-disclosure agreements being yeah. the vehicle by which the information is shared with a vendor, for example, or a researcher, typically there's either a contract in place with the vendor or the researcher, or if there is a multi-agency agreement, an MOU, it would be um, re reviewed and approved by the city's law department. Uh, there would be a business use case or a research proposal that uh, sometimes has to go through an IRB, Institutional Research Board. And if all of the legal requirements are made, uh, we may add a non-disclosure agreement to just ensure that um, there's additional protections uh, in place for the information. So what made you feel secure disclosing this information with members of the uh, public? I can't speak to whether, I mean, I haven't personally worked on agreements that have involved disclosure to members of the public, but um, we have worked with a number of agencies and vendors under um, agreements that have very strict privacy and uh, security restrictions. Okay. So, so uh, what data or data set does data breach have that open data portal does not have? That's, that's it's a different for him. Yeah. I, I don't know that we've done a specific accounting of that. Um, in, in general, uh, the majority of the data in, in DataBridge is, is also on open data. They're also in open data? Correct. So do you or anyone else in the mayor's office use DataBridge for oversight uh, over agency operations? Uh, DataBridge is, is less commonly used as an oversight tool and more often uh, to support the analysis conducted via the programs that own the data that's going into the, mm. into the tool. So how many agencies or people within city agencies have access to DataBridge? Um, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. And my guess is almost every city agency. They have access to in, it? In some form or another, yeah. The <coughs> yeah, of course the access is limited to, you know, uh, yeah. data appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they're they allowed access to DataBridge to do analysis on their own data. They don't use DataBridge to access other people's data unless there's been an agreement of some sort that's been created around that. Okay. So, so how is the administration currently storing the data in historic, historical records? Uh, this is related to 1098, uh, Yes, sir. Um, all, all of our data is on servers and it's backed up at a site B and we're in the process of moving it to the cloud to increase public access and at a re reduced cost. So in the process of uh, storage in the cloud? Yes, sir. Uh, how long will it take? 
who compete the process. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think the process will ever be complete given the volume of historical records that we have, but as we digitize more, we'll be acquiring more cloud storage so that it's all available as quickly as possible. When, when you mean uh, talking about cloud, which cloud are you talking about? You mean you hire some outside agencies like Amazon or well, Google? The, 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 for, city, for the city's contract currently is with Amazon, oh. um, but I know it's exploring other options in the cloud. And you know, our view is we want the most secure and least costly cloud access possible. I mean, we're not talking about confidential records when we're talking about historical records. We're talking about things that people need to get access to no matter where they live. So that's, we, do, we look forward to just bu buying as much as we can as cheaply as possible and putting all these records up there. So uh, when you sign a contract with Amazon, is it for how long the, the contract? Is? It's a citywide contract. I don't know the terms of it. Uh, do it negotiated it, but it allows agencies to purchase um, the data that they need when they need it. So if if we have a 185 terabytes of data we want to put up, we would buy the amount to put that up, and as we digitize more, we would buy more. It's all dependent on what we have. It's not like we're buying something to use in the cloud that we're not using. So what happens if you discontinue the contract? Does it, we have to remove all this data to another storage place? Well, I'm hoping we don't get there, but mm. I think you would have to do that, right? Uh. It will be a complicated process, though, right? To remove, to move like, such a big data, like, uh, uh, to it, it, say from from I, Amazon I'm gonna, to I'm Google. I'm going to defer to my friend from Do It because I don't I don't know that part of the technology, but I think it's doable. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about putting it up there is you put it up in a form that can be portable by the time it's all done. So it could be. It could take a while to do it, but mm. um, you should be able to port it to another cloud vendor probably without mm. a lot of changes. Yeah. It's not like you put something in your hole and can you can go there. And, uh, <laughs> what? It's not uh, like no? that. <laughs> but there is, I mean, but there is cataloging, cataloging software and programs mm. that would have to new move to the new vendor too. There would be some effort, but it's not. It's not as it, it's it's not reflective of the massive nature of, of the data. It's a lot more of, of you know just getting it to work in yeah. under the new vendor. Okay. So has the Department of Records and Information Service worked with any entities with, expert, with, with, with expertise in converting books or other paper records to digital formats? Yes, sir. In fact, our digital archivist uh, is really, uh, this is her skill set, and she started a year ago and is really terrific, and we consult regularly with our colleagues at the National Archives, the State Archives, our team just presented at the National Association of Archivists Convention and uh, received high praise for their work on digitization. So we, we take all sorts of input in order to do th create the best product possible. So only national archives? You, you no, state archives. Uh, there are archives throughout this okay. the country and world, and our team is in contact with them. All right. So we are also joined by Councilmember Kalos. Uh, Councilmember Holden, I uh, have a question. Um, the agencies routinely that we've seen, as a, as a council member, I've seen agencies withhold information. And um, for instance, um, DHS, Department of Homeless Services, I can't find, um, and they won't allow, they won't give us access to, for instance, homeless, um, the areas that they're, they're in my district that um, I have the most homeless. Um, I'm trying to find out information um, so I can help. So actually, so we can actually get volunteer organizations to help. But yet, routinely, we don't get that information uh, on where the homeless are coming from, where are they housed, so forth and so on. Um, we hope that uh, Speaker Johnson's bill will, will address that. But can you? Uh, so I, I assume it's up to the individual agencies. That they're deciding on the data where it's um, what they're going to release. Yes, the agency privacy officers typically make the determinations as to uh, what federal, state, and local laws apply to uh, either permit or restrict the disclosure of the uh, requested information. Is there any oversight on that? that does, does, uh, is it coming from the mayor's office or who's, if, if, we, ha if we challenge that? Uh, 
Well, the, uh, the new legislation that the City Council passed this past year, the Identifying Information Law, does create a role for the Chief Privacy Officer uh, to be able to review uh, data sharing requests based upon the best interest of the city, um, and that would be as between the, a city agency with another city agency. Um, but, a, but as uh, mentioned in the testimony, we cannot overcome uh, federal and state law that may apply to the specific okay. data. As regarding historical data, does that just all of it goes out or will be put on the cloud or is it uh, is that being also um, some withheld some of the data it's not withheld the records are available to people a lot okay. of it is in hard copy format so a researcher would ask for the records we'd bring them they'd review them they'd do the research okay so um but as we digitize the material it's just put up for people to draw their conclusions where they find them. Oh, all of it okay thank so you sir. thanks sir. Good morning. I want to thank uh, our technology committee uh, chair, Peter Koo, uh, for his leadership on these issues, his commitment to focusing on technologies and partnerships we've already worked on around uh, using the Internet of Things to monitor our city's infrastructure and improve it, uh, namely the Link NYC kiosks. I also want to thank him for uh, chairing this uh, committee hearing on a package of uh, transparency uh, legislation. Uh, transparency is one of my favorite words. <laughs> uh, so I want to just uh, thank uh, Pauline O'Toole for uh, the amazing work you've done at the Department of Records and Information Services uh, that we affectionately refer to as uh, Doris. Uh, you built the open records portal for folks to send uh, FOIL requests, and uh, if anyone is interested in seeing a government record, what is the URL to request one through the Open Records Portal? Need your mic on, please. My, my apologies, nyc.gov slash open records. And since you raised that topic, can I just say that our very small development team won a statewide award for that work? Uh, how many folks were on that team? Four. And uh, that, that entire system was built in free and open source software? Yes, sir, it was. Great. Uh, so I'm here to speak to introduction 1098, which speaks to uh, digitizing archival records. Uh, s in your testimony, you referred to uh, 185 terabytes. In particular, if I wanted to look at old historical photos, where could I look at those? Uh, you can look at them on our website, nyc.gov slash records. And th that sounds like a lot of photos. And, and is, are those proprietary? Does anybody own them? Can I, or, or can I? We, the people of New York City, own them. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go and browse them, and you can download a, a low resolution copy, um, maybe watermarked. Um, but they're there for public viewing, and then we make them available. If people want to publish a book, we have a small fee that they pay in order to do that. Great. And so Introduction 1098 hopes to build upon the repository of historical data. And uh, I, I think I, I in, in different conversations, we've, we've heard about different documents where this, this famous person's birth record was there, or this family had their uh, s signed in at a different location, and just uh, is there is there a way to prioritize certain documents, for instance, uh, land use items? And I guess the idea here is for Doris to work with different agencies. So the City Planning Commission has a lot of detailed records, and the Department of City Planning recently updated its portal. So you can look at different land use items and click on them and uh, see documents from 80 years ago, sorry, 20 years ago. However, certain land use items are still missing. I, I think one of my most interesting moments as an elected official was we were looking at a subway station on Lexington and 86th Street, which has a subway, uh, has stairs inside the building, and it was based on, I believe, a 1906 easement, uh, which I forced the MTA after several months or years to pull and give to me. Uh, would there be a way through introduction 1098, and I will admit MTA is not a city agency, but to work with agencies to perhaps pull some for instance, prioritizing land use documents so that we can reach into 
uh, the, the decades and, and centuries of old promises that perhaps have never been kept. Um, yes, and the, the way we prioritize the digitization of the records is through the public demand. If the records are frequently being requested, we will put them on a priority list to digitize. Um, and the other reason is if they're uh, fragile and vulnerable, we would want to digitize them and make them available in that format so people aren't handling documents of hundreds of years old that could, um, could be harmed. We do have uh, uh, funding from uh, in this year's budget to digitize the building um, plans for Lower Manhattan uh, from the inception of the Department of Buildings in 18, I forget the year, let's say 68, something like that, um, and those will be readily available. Um, but in order to put something in the queue, we would have to really have demand, which is more than one request. But we do make the materials available upon request, and many um, you know, researchers, people who work in land use, come to find what was the historical, uh, what are the historical records for the land that they're developing or living in. Are there ways we could improve upon introduction 1098 so that it would not be a laborious task of little value, but uh, so that it could proactively work with agencies to identify projects that might be considered of little or no value now because it's inaccessible to the general public and people don't even know it exists, to integrating it into larger efforts like the City Planning Commission's efforts or it passed a different law relating to privately owned public spaces and uh, I know that the Municipal Arts Society have been trying to go through those documents, so just trying to digitize public records that relate. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm now a land use chair, so I'm very <laughs> focused on <laughs> land use areas. Good. Um, yes, I think we, are, are, we welcome the opportunity to digitize more and more and more records and would work collaboratively with all of the institutions you named and others, as, and we do do that. I think the thing that the biggest issue for the archi archivists was the requirement to create a new record based on historical data can, that exists in the original records because it is n not part of their practice. It would run afoul of their code of ethics. So it's that creation of records rather than the digitization piece. So we want to digitize as much as we can and make it available. Thank you. Sure. All right. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Kalos. So, uh, what non public data set do you use for agencies' oversight? No <laughs> answer? Um, we can certainly uh, think through it and get back to you. I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, most of what we use for oversight is, in fact, made public. Um, we've got the MMR that's coming out today, the data sets that come through open data. Um, and so most of that information, um, most of the information that we use for oversight um, is made public there. And also, uh, I have a question, sir. You mentioned that uh, the clean room is not a good play, uh, thing. Uh, so what are the alternative uh, strategies to a clean room? Yeah? <coughs> you know, um, I think the idea of creating, um, you know, audit trails around the data and responsibility for the party who views the data, but cl a clean room in and of itself doesn't have, there's no, no specific terminology in the realm of data that, that refers to clean room and, just, and defines what that is. It kind of implies more of a physical limitation of the data than the actual electronic limitation that would be required. So in order to, to um, come up with a, with a solution, we'd really have to sit down and work through the actual requirements of, uh, of the data access and, 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 and use going forward. There's, there's no general principle that would govern that. Mm -hmm. So, so going back to uh, the previous uh, questions, uh, 
So who, who are the vendors and, who, and, and is the data the same on City Bridge as available to the public? Can you name some of the vendors? So who you sorry, which, which vendors? Yeah, the, Wait, uh, the vendors who, who, who want to do research, right? Or, or I, I don't have any spe specific examples of, of vendors who, who we share data with. There's one vendor I can think of uh, that was part of a citywide data integration project agreement. Um, I believe they were federally qualified health centers that were doing some work uh, concerning identifiable information um, and access to health care. Okay, yeah. I should also, um, if I may, speak to your question raised earlier concerning the use of non-public data at least with respect to the citywide data integration projects that are advancing research and best practices. Um, there is uh, work underway at, at agencies and agencies working uh, collaboratively to identify the needs of, for example, high engagers of city services to better understand those populations and to improve coordination of services to those individuals. So, so uh, is the data on data bridge the same as on uh, open portal? Uh, the same. I mean, if it would depend on on which data set. Right. So, so it they're is. Not, they're um, not the same. Well, they're they're two two separate streams. So the determination for what should be eligible for open data is, as we previously said, made by the the agency owners and their uh, privacy officers and general counsels. Um, and data is is put into DataBridge to support. Uh, analysis of a particular program. Um, and typically, it, most of the data there I is public, just by the, the fact that most of the data is public in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, but it is from the stream from the agency source, uh, and there isn't really a, a, a cross accounting of which things are public and which aren't. Typically, that it's, it's it's filtered down by the time it gets to DataBridge because it's for a, a particular purpose. Uh, Council Member Holden, you have a question? Yeah. Um, can I get back to the historical photos for a second? As a researcher and somebody that's um, worked on the history of the neighborhoods, um, I was always always annoyed at the um, the watermarks, uh, which were all at the time diagonally all across the photo. Do you need to do that? I mean. Can't we just put a copyright on, in a corner or? There are, I mean, the city has the copyright to the records. Uh, putting a copyright in the corner is not gonna, um, not gonna assist us in selling the photos and making our revenue targets for the city. How much is, uh, how much do you generate in that, uh, you um, know? From all together between vital records and historical photos, we generate around a million dollars of revenue. A million dollars, but so, if it's, the photos are owned by the people, so we're selling them to the people. Do you, people do you from all over the world, sir. S so, I mean, th so I if it's all over the world, why not down, I mean, they're low res, and you generate only a million dollars. It's not a lot of money. Um, Please tell that to OMB. OMB, okay, <laughs> okay. But I just feel that the watermarks diagonally across the, the entire photo actually kind of destroy the, the, you know, the looking at, at the historical image of New York City, let's say Manhattan, or you, you kind of, you, you, dis, you spoil the experience. I just want to throw that out. I'm <laughs> sorry you feel that way. Um, I can get back to you on how we might do things differently, but um, you know, we get a lot of people who look at those historical photos. I'd say most of them don't think they had a spoiled experience. Can, I can also get people to tell you that they, they're annoyed with the uh, diagonal watermarks. Okay. Thanks. Uh, j just to follow along with my colleague's point, even in the private sector at this point, uh, companies like uh, 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 Photostock and, and what have you, they, they have very minimal watermarks and, and I would just, uh, I would be happy, I, I would just say that a million dollars is is almost a rounding error in our budget. So, if we were able to ask OMB that whether or not this <laughs> uh, 
that if we could reduce the fees, as it were, whether they could live with that, or would you be open to removing the watermark from low-resolution, non-print publication quality photos? I'd have to look into it. Oh, okay. Uh, I wanted to uh, follow up on the uh, uh, data bridge uh, legislation. Where does a uh, where does data bridge overlap with HHH, sorry, HHS Connect? Uh, and so HHS Connect is a service that is offered and owned by the Mayor's Office of Operation. They call themselves Ops, I call them Moo. Uh, but it allows agencies to share information after signing a memorandum of understanding. Uh, the reason I'm so interested in HHS Connect is because of legislation we passed last year called Automatic Benefits, where I would like any New Yorker receiving any benefit for which they are screened, and actually any New Yorker who's paying taxes, uh, whether they know it or not because it's being deducted from their paychecks, to for the government to use the information we already know to just mail them a snap card in the mail or uh, any other number of 40 government benefits that we currently offer. So can you tell me a little bit about the difference between uh, the bridge and uh, the connect? I, I can speak about the particular tool you're speaking about, which is the Worker Connect program. Mm -hmm. um, you are correct. There is a data exchange interagency agreement that's been in place since, I believe, 2010. Uh, there are five agency data providers for that tool, and it uh, is centered on a, an algorithm-based matching um, uh, uh, tool that can um, sh have agency information from the five, uh, e any one of the five uh, data providers matched with um, information that is from another agency that may sign on to the agreement. Um, that is distinct from a privacy perspective. Actually, it is the, the model which is um, which is based in a use case process, a business use case process that looks, as uh, spoken earlier, about um, about uh, how to share data across agencies when there's identifiable information. Um, that model was used to um, develop the citywide data integration framework, which exists today. And um, yeah, f that's from a privacy perspective. I can speak to that. From a technology perspective, I defer to my colleagues um, to talk about the how DataBridge fits into that, but um, it is a separate tool that is used uh, under a specific agreement. I should also mention that the um, Citywide Data Integration Agreement is now signed. It's a master framework agreement um, signed by s 47 city agencies, and um, I'm happy to have a further conversation about the with the council if you're interested in, in uh, taking advantage of that framework. Yes, please. So on, on the technology side, Don can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, the uh, Worker Connect product is, uh, is fundamentally, as Laura was saying, a, a master data management solution um, that's about matching data and surfacing the results to uh, the appropriate people. Um, DataBridge is a data warehouse uh, which allows programs to pull data in from various different sources and combine them in ways that are advantageous to their particular analysis goals um, and uh, visualize it through uh, various different front-end tools, including uh, some that we make public on nyc.gov. Uh, when the city, uh, which published this in a journal, which is the only reason I know about it, I, I guess I just wish we could be a little bit more transparent with what some of the great work we do. Uh, when the city purchased data from Experian to identify the four-year-olds in the city, was that through CityBridge, or is that data now residing in CityBridge, or uh, was that done separately? I if, if I may, I, I believe you're talking about the pre-K outreach yeah. program. Yes. Um, that team was centered at the at well, uh, combination of City Hall and Department of, um, of Education. Moda. and. Okay. Uh, there was a, an agreement um, by which I can't speak to the Experian agreement. I can only speak to the city agency data exchange for that agreement. But um, I, c I, I don't know if maybe I'll defer to my colleagues on the well, other details. Yeah, I, I wasn't familiar with the Experian uh, agreement per se, but this is the way um, uh, analytical projects like this come about. So this was an ad hoc project 
um, uh, very near term, mm -hmm. there was required to pull together data from a number of dis disparate sources, both mm -hmm. externally and internally, to try to identify where the four-year-olds were. And uh, we used a variety of city tools to be able to do that. I think mm -hmm. we used the analytics platform. We may have used DataBridge as well. I don't recall specifically. But that's the way, that's the thing to remember about DataBridge, mm -hmm. is that it's not, an, it's not a piece of infrastructure with tentacles that extend throughout the city through which we can tap anything that we want. It's a tool that we can implement on an ad hoc basis to solve specific problems. Mm -hmm. And that's really, that's really the way that it's been working. Um, but um, the need to solve analytical problems oftentimes will involve agreement with, uh, with, with vendors for external data as well as, uh, as leveraging internal data. And that's really a lot of what we do with DataBridge. So, so I guess I'm not, so is HHS Connect or Worker Connect just city agency data and data bridges external data? What, how would, what is the difference between the two products they're or are they? They're separate systems. Do they, sh do they have overlapping data? I, it, it's possible, I, I don't know. I guess what's the difference? Well, as I said, the, so the, in the Worker Connect example, the data is sourced from a number of agencies. It's run through a master data management solution, and an end product of that matching is surfaced to the, the user who logs in uh, with their credentials. Oh, okay, so anything that is in Worker Connect should be in DataBridge because DataBridge has, is larger and doesn't have restrictions on who can do it. You're, it's just the, the warehouse and, and the... Uh, DataBridge does contain more data, um, but it is, the, the, the two programs are, are separate from each other. So it would be a matter of coincidence if uh, some of the data used to do the matching for Worker Connect were brought into DataBridge for, uh, to in support of a different program, yeah. Uh, and, and forgive me, I, I was a little late. So, and, and you're, you support the, the idea of having the clean room for examining uh, the DataBridge? We don't, I mean, we're not familiar with, with, uh, with the use of the term clean room vis-a-vis -vis data, per se, except in the cases where I mean, the only reference we could find was in the financial industry where um, during mergers and acquisitions they create a, an isolated area to have documents to do diligence. So it's not really something that exists within, the, to my knowledge, within the realm of electronic data. Uh, great. And, but uh, do you support the legislation? Yeah, I mean, not as it's written. It, w it, w it would take a conversation. We're really interested in having a conversation around the intent of the legislation. Mm -hmm. But there's a there's a great deal that would have to be detailed in for us in order for us to understand uh, how to respond appropriately. So I guess one thing I wanted to share is just this concept of if you're at an agency, you might be asking for well, maybe I need this point of data and that point of data, and so you get to see uh, you, you get to see. It, I'm going to go with the metaphor of the three blind people and the elephant. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one person grabs the tail and it's a snake. One person grabs the, uh, a leg and it's a tree. By being able to see the enormity of the full data set and all the different pieces, that's where somebody who's an information architect like I am can say, okay, so we don't actually know how many four-year-olds we have because we don't have a list of four-year-olds, but we have a list from DOHMH of all the live births, and then we have metadata mm -hmm. over here from the vaccination records. So now we have an accurate count of the number of people who received their three-year uh, vaccination, and therefore if we match that to other things like a, a voter file or city ID or what have you, we, we can now take eight different things that gave us different pieces of the elephant and identify all the four-year-old mm -hmm. elephants in the city of New York <laughs> to get them pre-K <laughs> and to not wait for them to apply, but to actually just send them an, a letter or even an email if we have that information to say, hey, just wanted to let you know, yes, there was an application deadline, but we didn't assume that you needed to apply for it. So FYI, if your four-year-old wants to start pre-K, 
Uh, here is a seat waiting for you. Wouldn't you like to take it? I can't speak to the policy considerations or the legal considerations um, about reaching out in that manner, but um, with the pre-K effort that has been underway since 2014, we have, I believe, it's about seven or eight different agreements in place um, that we're working to consolidate across agencies, and we have done a significant amount of data matching to be able to identify those, those four-year-olds. Um, it's not exactly where it needs to be, only because of the privacy laws that you know, we've had to cobble together a, um, a patchwork solution. We do work very closely with agencies and the administration um, and our partners to try to find workable solutions. But um, I think, you know, we've been accomplished uh, quite a bit in the years, I, I believe, um, through data integration work in this area. I, I would just note for the uh, sponsors and, and the staff, please make sure that council members are allowed into this clean room and I, uh, please add me as a sponsor <laughs> and... Privacy laws permit. <laughs> I, I, it's, I, with regards to privacy laws, I, I understand it's brought up quite often. I, I've submitted, to, I believe your agency has in hand a 30 page memo reviewing fe federal, it. state, mm -hmm. and city privacy laws mm -hmm. and privacy amongst employees mm -hmm. is more protected than privacy between an agency and the public. And I think the thing that I find most interesting is where you want the most privacy in life is between you and law enforcement. You, you don't want to get in trouble because you, you, you did something that you thought wasn't a big deal. Like for instance, I don't know a New Yorker who hasn't jaywalked. Uh, and so you don't want police to be able to say, we, we know that you are a serial jaywalker and you have jaywalked a thousand times <laughs> this month alone and uh, what have you. But there is a broad exemption at federal, state, and city, and in private sector for any law enforcement activity. I find it difficult to believe that the, uh, and based on my own legal research, that the federal, state, and city laws prevent using data to give people free food from SNAP benefits, mm -hmm. free assistance on their rent through senior citizen rent increase and mm -hmm. disabled rent increase exemption, and that all of those taken together prevent us from just, instead of making somebody apply for pre-K, mm -hmm. just saying, here's your seat. Again, I, I think you know we've done a lot of work in the area of solutioning around um, within the privacy framework that exists today, and uh, by no means do privacy laws preclude the uh, solutioning around providing important programs and services to to our uh, our residents. Um, but it's very much a fact, as you know, if you you know from your research, I'm sure, um, fact-based uh, determination based upon the laws that apply to particular data elements and data categories that have to there has to be a legal pathway to allow it. But not to say that there aren't any. It's just a, it's a fact-specific determination under the various uh, applicable laws. And just one last question for uh, Department of Records Information Services. So some of the city's uh, original records are not maintained by Doris, as far as I understand. I'm looking, I, I know that the CUNY School of Law, sorry, the New York Law School uh, has many of our city's decisions, particularly BSA decisions. They do a lot of work in the BSA, and that is, they, they somehow ended up owning our BSA decisions. I think they may also have COIB decisions. They have an entire portal for searching a lot of government information that I think should also reside with you. Uh, similarly, I have a friend, his name's Dennis Harlow. We went to law school together. Uh, we, we do, and uh, he, he may be one of the smartest attorneys I've ever met in my life. And for fun, he goes to John Jay College of Criminal Justice in the CUNY system, where he goes through the trial transcripts of the County of New York from 1883 to the 1927. Uh, where he's reading through uh, the uh, Court of General Sessions, uh, which is the predecessor to our local courts, as well as the pri tribunals in the police courts, which really went through some of the moral crimes and what have you that in this day and age might seem strange or at least captivates the imagination. You mentioned requests for information, but is there just for, for the sake of this friendship, my, my friendship with him, would you consider digitizing some of these records? 
And is there also an op are you tracking people who show up in person and pull records or who show up at partner sites that house additional pieces? So I guess the ostensible question is, are you tracking how many people check the book out from the library? And then the other issue I found with NYPL is they don't actually track how many people take a book off the shelf and read it in the library. So some of the most popular books in any library, no one knows that they're mm -hmm. popular mm -hmm. because they aren't checked mm -hmm. out. Um, well, there were several pieces to that, so let me see if I can get them all together, starting with the last one. We are not a lending library, but our reference service desk does um, note the topics and the materials that people are interested in, in perusing, and they have to obtain them for them, right? The people cannot come in and browse the stacks uh, in the municipal library um, because it's a research library, not a lending library. We also track when people come in and they ask for a variety of archival records, what those are. Um, not so much to see what a person is researching, but what kind of records are in demand, so then we prioritize digitizing those. We do have a number of the records that you mentioned are at uh, John Jay. Um, I'd have to look into the agreement at, with the New York Law School uh, uh, that publishes the BSA and um, other other um, records or transcripts. Okay, but tell your friend to come. All right. We've got it, we've got it all. Thank you. Yeah. So we have to move on because of time limitations. So uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, oh, Yeah, no, no question. Okay. Isn't that easy? Uh, we have uh, panel number uh, number two from the public. Now we have a uh, Yale Fox. Uh, Information Rachel. Rachel Bird and Noel Hidalgo and Alex uh, Camarala. Uh, so let's start now. Please identify yourself and then you, you can start. Uh, doesn't matter who. Are, are we on the clock or? Uh, hi, good morning. My name is Alex Camarda. I'm the senior policy advisor for reInvent Albany. I, I won't th read through my testimony. I think I'm actually going to comment mostly on what was said by um, the different agency officials in relation to the bills. So uh, regarding um, intro 986, um, sponsored by the council member Ku, chair of the committee, um, we are generally supportive of the city council receiving uh, data that's in agency reports. We also believe that this data should be placed in the open data portal. I think you heard from the head of the mayor's office of operations that they believe that that's typically done when the, when the data is regularly maintained, which is what the law requires. Um, I can tell you from our experience, we've certainly seen tabular data sets in agency reports that are not in the, the open data portal. I think that's actually more often the, the case than is the case. And so we would like to see uh, agency 
reports that have tabular data, regularly maintained or not, uh, made available in the open data portal. And we suggested an amendment to the bill to that effect. But I think really what's most important here is that the regularly maintained data that's currently in reports, there should be in a more um, ag aggressive effort to put those data sets in the portal. Um, with regard to the Kalo spill, you heard from the Doris Commissioner that um, it's very burdensome to be able to go through all these historical records to determine uh, which data sets have public value and which should be placed in the open data portal. Uh, generally speaking, um, you know, we, we believe the intent of this bill is, is something that's worthwhile. I think that the, their current framework for processing digitization could be applied to putting data sets in the portal. Uh, we heard from the commissioner that uh, as demanded by the public or by archivists or others, that that's how they determine the uh, order or the sequence for digitizing data. So we think that a similar process could be in put in place for putting data sets in the portal. Uh, I, I don't know, it wasn't commented on by the Doris Commissioner, but when they're digitizing documents, we would hope that they are doing so in a manner that allows for extraction of um, of the data sets via OCR. I mean, sometimes we see data sets, uh, I'm sorry, um, archived information and it's just PDF'd and then you can't search for the, infra for the data in the PDF and you can't extract the data set. We would hope that they're doing so in their, uh, in, uh, as they go through and digitize their documents. We think that should be a requirement and we don't think it would be too burdensome for them to put some data sets in the portal as they're going through and digitizing the priority documents. Uh, on the last bill, the, the Johnson bill, um, I think what's missing from the, from the previous testimony was there's really an imbalance between the mayoralty and the city council when it comes to access to data. Uh, my understanding is the city council has to ask agency officials for data whenever they're providing their oversight functions. That's how they obtain data about the agencies. That is fundamentally an imbalance, and I think this bill's intent is to try to correct that imbalance so that the city council has access to at least some raw data. And we support that effort. Uh, as far as the particulars as to whether there should be a room, a physical room, or some kind of digital access, uh, we're not particular on, but we do support the idea of the city council uh, accessing data in its rawest form and p creating a more formalized, structured manner to do so. Uh, I, I, I don't know to what extent agency officials, when they provide data to the city council, vet it for all the privacy restrictions. I assume they do so through their councils when they, before they provide the data to the city council, but the point being, any data the council, I believe, currently receives is data that uh, has been contextualized, has been uh, further segmented by the agencies themselves, and we'd like to see the council have access to as much raw data as possible. Thank you, and I'll stop there. Thank you, yeah. Mitch, yeah. <coughs> Could you use the mic? Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's on? Good morning, Chairman Ku and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting the public. Well, first, identify yourself. Oh, sorry. Apologies. My name is Rachel Bird. I'm with the Public Utility Law Project. We are a 37-year-old public interest law firm as well as an advocacy and education firm that, or organization that's sole mission is to advocate, educate, and litigate on behalf of low-income utility rate payers. Um, we highly support the idea and the need for um, as much data availability as possible. That's been a critical tool in PULP's work. Uh, we have, for example, um, in our rate cases when the utilities must go to the Public Service Commission and um, apply to get rate increases, we, a we access their data and spend an enormous amount of time crunching it. 
in order to make the case for them getting lower increases and for providing better discounts and consumer services. We also use it, I'm actually going completely off, off my testimony, but it's buried in here somewhere. Um, we've also used it as well. We've, we've done FOIL requests for two years worth of Public Service Commission complaint data about energy service companies. We found 10,000 complaints and of those, we were able to analyze them and find out where and under what circumstances and which populations they were targeting. So we found that the ESCOs, as we call them, targeted low-income communities, people of color, um, low English or limited English-speaking communities, and seniors, basically the people who are most vulnerable to a pitch for lower-cost energy. Um, we have done, um, let's see, I have more in here. This is actually specific. Um, oh, we did, and we recently, we've been getting more involved as the city has gotten more involved in the question of water bills and liens. We accessed the open data portal and were able to find, and this was last spring when one of the first sales of water liens um, came up, we were able to um, find exactly which boroughs and how many liens were potentially going to be sold in May. It was, some, it was I believe, 7,698. We were able to determine the highest concentration in which boroughs, and uh, we were able to actually help people who did not know they actually have rights to deferred payment agreements and other payment plans and other negotiating processes that we encourage improvement on um, were available to people. So having that kind of data available was eye-opening. Um, we did not know at the time that that information was available. Oh, I hate these things. I can't find now what I'm looking for. Um, so my apologies for now. Okay. Um, Somehow my computer has decided that I can't look at this. Um, apologies. Um, Do you want to come back later? Uh, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Do you want to continue? Oh, so yeah. I can. My, I, say, I have to figure out how I can get home from my desk. Hello. Uh, my name is Noel Hidalgo from Beta NYC. Uh, I'm appreciative of the three bills that are being introduced today. Uh, I have some general concerns that I'll start off with. One is that the mayor's office of data analytics uh, is still missing a chief analytics officer, and we're still missing a chief technology officer. Both of these roles, in addition to the suite of agency representatives that you saw in front of you, are critically important to implement city's IT technology and data policy. Um, and I'm concerned that both of these programs, MODA and the CTO's office, will be underfunded through the next budget cycle as we continue to have a lack of very clear leadership in both of those agencies. Um, I am similar to Alex, won't exactly read all of my notes because I thought that the testimony from the administration was quite illuminating in regards to data bridge. Um, it's kind of absurd that you have to write a legislation to require access to the city's data. Um, um, me, to me, this is almost a testament of a lack of leadership from the uh, administration. They should be willing to share data and provide uh, opportunities for council members and their staff to secure data or to get access to secure data. Um, CUSP, the NYU Center for Urban Pedagogy, actually has such a secure, clean data room. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why they were founded was to help provide a safe, secure, clean data analytics capacity between governments and private parties. And so it's kind of um, crazy to hear the agency say that they don't have uh, examples when there are National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, examples, that there's federal information processing standards and publications. Like the federal government is doing this. Uh, I've have worked in secure data centers. So it's kind of crazy to hear that there is no examples or there's no best practices when there clearly are. Um, and it's really absurd. 
absurd that they refuse to figure out a way to work with council to make sure um, that council members, Kalos' concerns in regards to children in PK um, should have access to school. Um, so in regards to the data agencies and reports, um, uh, similar to reInvent Albany, we continue to find examples where reports are published from the mayor's office that are released in a PDF that don't have structured data and that aren't machine readable. Um, and so we support this particular uh, bill. Our community actually asked uh, a few additional questions um, in regards to making sure that these reports are legislated to be put up on the agency website um, or at least shared in a, in a place that has access. I know that Doris is in charge of receiving these types of reports, but there has been some issue with those types of reports being publicly accessible uh, in the past. Um, second to that um, is that we would love to know that when an agency discloses what type of data they are, uh, the, the, the system, uh, how do I say this? When they release data that they describe also the system that's collecting that data, um, this is critical to um, a charter revision commission that was uh, created COPIC, where there is the city's data dictionary, uh, or not data dictionary, uh, data catalog, which was the first data catalog produced. Um, it specifies exactly what are the fields that are foilable, and we think that every report that the, an agency hands off to the administration should also very clearly indicate what information is publicly accessible either through a freedom of information law, so that way we can get around some of the privacy concerns that were expressed by the administration. Um, and then in regards to 1098, uh, Council Member Kalos' bill in regards to the digitization of historical data, over the past summer, we've been working with community boards to understand their tech and data needs. Uh, and what we've discovered is that there are uh, an internal desire to digitize archived agendas and uh, permits that have some type of stipulations around them. For example, liquor licenses currently are essentially a structured document that's held at the state, but many community boards provide explicit stipulations on how, when, and where alcohol can be served within a, a, a liquor establishment, and none of that is structured data. So we hope that through this bill that there is a, a conversation and value that is placed upon uh, getting community boards to digitize their historical data. Um, and then in our written testimony, we have some other concerns in regards to how do community groups and community institutions are consulted within that particular bill, what exactly and how is the methodology of public value defined, um, and then ultimately, you know, how do we use open source tools that essentially build a framework for pr best practices across a all agencies to go through their historical pieces of data that can then be shared publicly and available in a machine readable format. Thank you. We are also joined by Council Member Lander. Uh, next. Oh. Hi, my name is uh, Yale Fox, and I'm the CEO of Rent Logic. We are a tech powered standards association that grades every apartment building in New York City as A, B, C, or F based on health and safety standards, very similar to how the city grades restaurants. Our software uses open data from HPD, DOB, and ECB to evaluate how well a building complies with the city's warranty of habitability. We focus on code compliance and violations, not whether or not a building is considered luxury, and we don't accept reviews from tenants like a user-generated review site. The greatest use of our platform is that it distills building histories into an easy-to-use public interface that's accessible to anyone. It helps keep renters from moving into bad buildings, while also giving recognition to good landlords, and it helps make it easier for cities to understand their housing stock and code enforcement needs. Today, approximately one in eight New Yorkers uses RentLogic when they're searching for a new apartment. This is changing the market because renters are beginning to seek out A-rated buildings over ones with histories of bad management. And it's worth noting that our data shows that most of the landlords are actually pretty good, but a few bad actors ruin it for the community, the city, and frankly, for the reputation of the industry as a whole. As previously mentioned, the data our algorithm uses comes primary fr primarily from HPD, DOB, and ECB, and our work wouldn't be possible without open data initiatives because of how the city tracks these violations like, like mold, bed bugs, and heat, hot, heat and hot water problems. Um, these same data sets are used by tens of thousands of companies for, for completely different reasons. 
And while the data is good, there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, you've probably heard before that it's not coded um, or, or machine readable, but it, it should be almost like numerically coded. So instead of saying bed bugs, it should say 0103 bed bug. That's a lot easier for a, for a piece of software to pick up because there's 10 different ways of, of spelling it. Um, one problem that you see with the open data as well, and this isn't just in housing, is, is how it's being collected in the first place. And with garbage in, you're gonna end up getting garbage out. So in our platform, if a property owner has a low rating due to having many violations, we actually send a third party state licensed building inspector to conduct an inspection and, and verify that the problems have been fixed and that the violations have been cured. We built an app that, that can go on inspectors' phones to, insist, to assist with inspecting the building and I don't understand why the city doesn't do something like this. Um, it will make sure that the information that's collected is more than just data. There can now be media attached to it, and it will also force it to be standardized, which will fix all the misspellings and, and entry problems. While something like that may potentially work for today and moving forward, there's still all the data that's been collected in the past. So every startup, at least that we've spoke with, that wants to work with city data, city data has to put in a ton of tedious and expensive work into just cleaning it up and to, to get it to a place where you can use it. So for us, it took us a year just to get the data into a format where we could actually analyze it. Um, so I think the city should, should figure out a way to clean up the existing data, and there might be an easy, an easy way to do it, to work with the big apps or a beta.nyc or a similar type of organization and have like a competition. It doesn't have to be for a lot of money. People would actually jump at something to, at, at, at the chance to work on a problem like this. Um, and in addition to that, thousands of apps that are out there would more or less be improved overnight. Um, and then not to mention, New York City would be recognized worldwide uh, and by the open data community, which could possibly start to inspire other cities to start to do similar things. So in conclusion, um, we need the right data to make the right decisions. And the hard part for most of it is actually already done, but if you were to clean it at the source, you would see an immediate positive, over the positive effect almost overnight. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you for all your testimony and support. Uh, uh, we have one question. Sorry, John, no, no, I'm good. You want to um, go back? Okay, yeah, please. I, I was able to. Please, you have to finish it. Well, th I wanted to address the, <coughs> excuse me, the issue of the confidentiality um, that it is, is touched on in the speaker's bill. Uh, the, the access to agency data for the purposes of better oversight, while emphasi emphasizing the importance of protecting confidentiality, <laughs> helps, helps um, help determine, I'm oh sorry, or personally identifiable information by creating a new method and safeguards for access to such records. Pulp supports the principle of broadening access to agency records while protecting the confidentiality of those New Yorkers to which such records refer. In the public utility field, protection of the personally identifiable information, or PII, of consumers is strongly required by both state and federal law. It is consistent with such safeguards, therefore, for the Speaker's Bill, to similarly take steps to protect PII while allowing the underlying data to be scrutinized as part of legislative oversight. For example, um, anybody who receives one of eight public assistance programs registered with HRA is eligible for utility consumer discount, um, a low income discount, but that information has to be carefully protected. So when someone is found eligible when they apply, it is can that information without the background information, the details, is conveyed to the utility who then puts the um, consumer into a low income discount program. So, it, but there had to be extensive negotiations to protect their privacy in that process. The speaker's bill is also critically important in assisting the council to fully ex explicate agencies' budgets when making their decisions during budget consideration. Certainly in 2018, council members repeatedly requested details of programs, asking agencies to be more transparent in their submitted budget budgets. For example, when something called a one-shot was referred to during one hearing, it was discussed solely in terms of rental assistance. While critically important to New Yorkers, one-shots also referred to a state-required utility assistant program under PSL 131S that provides an essential safety net for low-income New Yorkers. 
New York City is, is appropriately responsive to consumers in need of these funds, often the difference between warmth and light and cold and dark. And Pulp believes that more rigorous and aggressive pursuit of utility practices could actually save the city money because they would not need to draw on the 131S funding. How much, however, is not evident given the absence of such detail from the budget. We have tremendous resource in Doris. I won't, I'll leave that into the written part of the statement. Uh, what's going on? I'll, I'll pass on the rest of it. Um, I appreciate your time and patience with my technology problems. Thank you. So, Council Member Kalos, you have a short question, right? I, I just wanted to uh, uh, just thank uh, Yale Fox over at Rent Logic. I have gone through that same uh, data set. I would love to share my pivot table of every single different way we write violations with you. Uh, ultimately, uh, I'm happy to collaborate with everyone on the table around another – we shouldn't have to do a bill on this, but it would be really amazing if we had information architects in the city of New York who could do something which is like the first thing I learned, which is normalizing data so that the data that goes in is normalized. Um, we've been working with Beta NYC and NOLA on trying to get them to normalize the data going into the city record so that the data could be useful. Uh, I, I just want um, to ask to anyone on the uh, panel, but in particular uh, Yale and, and Noel, but like if you, if, if you were a city employee and they let you in, a, in that white room with all the city's data, how would that be different than just being able to uh, request an individual piece of data that you know already exists? I have to be wearing a different hat, uh, council member. Like, if, if I don't think the general, necessarily the general public would be allowed into the type of you room that the speaker. I'm asking if you were a city employee, what could you do with being in that clean room versus just knowing that maybe there's this piece of information you could request? Uh, I would be, uh, so as a cyclist, uh, I would be looking at a culmin uh, um, kind of a Venn diagram of um, three and one block bike lane complaints versus m actually looking at the uh, moving violations and the different types of summonses that would have been written in regards to uh, bike lane blockage or illegal parking. Uh, currently, we're we are not allowed to look at NYPD moving violations, and so uh, as we've seen through the Vision Zero. Um, people who tend to block bike lanes are uh, at atrocious drivers. Um, and I know that Councilmember Lander has introduced some legislation to look at bad drivers. And this is a way that we can start calling out uh, behavioral change um, in regards to drivers or uh, also uh, corporations uh, like delivery groups, that delivery companies that are routinely using bike lanes as staging areas for uh, your Amazon packages. Um, so that would be like one, uh, one, one Venn diagram. The other one uh, would be looking at um, deteriorating housing conditions, um, is to be able to pull together various uh, DOB databases. Um, we'll, we have some write-up of it on, on our website, but we're essentially looking at how um, 301 uh, quality of life service complaints like uh, Yale's integrating um, potentially leveraging DOB uh, permits to see exactly how many permits have been applied to a building that is then under uh, tenant protections and to start identify what are the most vulnerable buildings um, that currently are receiving some type of construction and yet have had a high quality of life uh, service requests, uh, meaning that there's a, an immediate threat to the tenants in those buildings um, around the loss of affordable housing. We have a, um, a Venn diagram. The medical examiner um, does not have any requirement to report suspicious deaths to the State Public Service Commission. And we recently had a tragedy this winter where a gentleman died from hypothermia. He had his heat cut off, his gas, from non-payment. And the Public Service Commission keeps of the state keeps detailed records um, of deaths due to, or 
mishaps or disconnections, um, turn offs, shut off notices, and the medical examiner has records of um, suspicious deaths or questionable deaths, but there is no connection made between the two unless it's highly publicized the way this particular incident was. So we would like to see some connection made between those, um, between those data. All right, thank you all. Thank you. We are also joined by Council Member Erwick. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, thank you all for coming to participate in this public hearing. Uh, this meeting uh, is adjourned.